Hello, guys. Welcome to the second segment here. Give me just one second here to get things up. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to give you a first, first Amendment introduction today. So this is outside what we, as I mentioned in the in the first segment, talking about the syllabus, there are numerous times where I go outside of the book to basically to supplement where it has holes, as well as, of course, to give more updated information. So what you'll what we're talking about here, this first part is really not found in the book. It is more um, me giving you a better understanding, a better background of where the First Amendment came from. So First Amendment, of course, being the bedrock of media law and um, and the free press, of course. And so, like I said, we're going to be spending about a month on the First Amendment. So I want to give, again, a background here. The First Amendment did not spring up out of nowhere. It is a historical um, artifact and, and has a context. And so I want to give, give some of that background. So, again, it is a... It is, the First Amendment is a product of history, and it is only in this political system that we have, this democracy, that really makes this First Amendment possible, okay, as well as an economic system as well. And that is one of the reasons why we have survived as a democracy here is, in fact, because of that free press. Okay, so first of all, a brief introduction to some of the main forms of government. So, and I'll talk about these all in a little, little bit greater depth here. So the main ones are a monarchy. Of course, it's been one of the predominant forms of government for centuries. Um, theocracies, based on religion. We have, of course, dictatorships in all of their different forms, whether they be by an individual um, or a an authoritarian figure or a group of people forming an oligarchy, okay, and obviously to colonialism as well as democracy. And so we'll talk about each one of these here. So one of the biggest forms, of course, until until well, for before we were, of course, a a country here, a free country, the United States. We were part of the monarchy. We were part of the British royalty. So um, there are numerous forms of this. One is an absolute form of monarchy where the, the monarch is indeed the head in many ways, again, similar to a dictator. Um, sometimes too, this is mentioned, you know, tied in with the theocracy. And part of the thing that these monarchs did to cement their power was to tie themselves in with religion and tying them in in one way was the, what is called is called the divine right of kings. Basically, God has ordained them, and of course, all of their lineage, um, all their successors, um, as God appointed. This is God's will, and of course, that makes it much stronger because if God is, if God is choosing this person as your leader, that makes it doubly hard to fight that, okay, to try and, and revolt against that, because you're therefore not just revolting against this monarchy, you're revolting against God and God's will. And so that is has been, of course, a powerful, powerful form of government. Um, what we had in, in the, the British system, of course, is a constitutional monarchy dating back to 1215. And here you had the the nobles, who had, of course, a lot of money, a lot of power, were able to force the king to sign this Magna Carta, which is basically a power sharing agreement in which there would be some representation. We have the House of Lords, and then we have, the, of course, the House of Commons. So House of Lords being generally those nobles that were in there forever, and then the, the more the rabble, the elected um, House of Commons. So the currency, the main thing that keeps these monarchies going is the bloodline. And that's why the having the heirs, having a male heir to succeed you was so important and led to numerous, numerous civil wars when there was not a, a clear successor. Okay. Um, so that has been the monarchy again when those bloodlines die out. They usually need to change 
to related related ones. Um, and again, we'd had uh, Oliver Cromwell, of course, um, as an example too of, of breaking entirely away from the monarchy. Then it went back to the monarchy in in England. So again, the the currency of of the monarchy is the bloodline. That is how they they retain their power, their right to rule. Theocracy is, as you can imagine, ruled by religion. Okay, and so basically, the religious leader often doubles as, as it says here the the head of the government. And so this is you see this in in Iran, and some of the other um, some of the other countries, especially going back, where again they were ruled. These are very religious countries, and um, that is how they rule. And of course. The currency of those forms of governments is those religious texts, be it the Quran, be it the Bible. Okay, so again, tied in similar to the divine right of kings, here we have, of course, the, the holy ruler is given power to interpret those texts and, of course, to rule over these people. So that is that is the currency. That is how they gain and keep their power is the power of, of those religious texts. And you you've heard about Sharia law. Basically, this is the legal system tied in with that theocracy, the legal system following the rules of, of the scriptures of those religious texts. So that so, you know, someone who, for example, commits the, the act of adultery, that goes against the religious texts. And in some um forms of government, of course, some theocracies that can result in stoning that person to death, you know, at least if they're a woman, of course. <laughs> Here we have, again, most of these being very patriarchal um, forms of government as well. So dictatorships, of course, quite often these are military. These are fascists, um, autocratic, or again, one form is ruled by um, ruled by a group. Again, these are these are your rich people, your aristocrats, your business owners, etc. And how do they rule? They fear through they rule through power, they rule through fear, and fear that, of course, that if you go against them, you're going to be killed. And that often includes fear of even saying anything against these dictatorships. So these are the main forms, obviously colonialism as well. And here we're we you we know this from our own experience here in North America, um, you have a rule by a foreign power. So they take over a country and they rule, they might have a puppet um, puppet government uh, set of leaders that they control, that they have power over and that execute their will. So again, typically this is this is accomplished through military power. And of course we see this saw this in South America, we saw this in North America, obviously Africa that got carved up by the colonial powers as well. So your France, your England, your Netherlands, Germany, um, Spain and Portugal, of course, all ruled through colonialism. And then of course we have democracy. So um, democracy takes also many different forms. Um, we have the full democracy. We saw this somewhat in, in the days of, of um, of Greece, for example, with their democracy. And you had, again, in some, some cases where it ruled like a town hall where everyone had a vote, okay? Um, typically what that has evolved in, especially as you get bigger and, and unable to have everyone coming together to vote um, on a certain policy or procedure, that um, turns into representational democracy. And that's what we have, which is another form of that is, is a republic. So. We don't have direct democracy, okay? We have, we elect representatives who then enact laws and vote on things, um, hopefully representing us. Of course, we know that is not always the case. So in that form of government, um, again, the, the vote, of course, is king. <laughs> that is the currency there. But key to that as well is is information. Okay. So in order for us to vote, in order for us to have this democracy in which we cast votes for these representatives, for example, or to on our on these policies, 
we need to have information. We need to have the information to be able to, to make wise decisions. Okay. And that is why, that is why we have the first amendment is so important. So the freedom of the press to be able to, to report on all of the things um, going on to inform the public is so important. The, feed, the freedom of speech, the ability for people to, to debate openly without fear of repercussions is huge in a democracy. And that's why too, we have um, one of the key parts of, of successful democracies is literacy. Okay, and that's why we have free universal education um, up through high school is that in order for us to have this informed public, we need a public that is able to read and write and discuss, again, these things in a public manner. And so that is why the First Amendment is so critical for a democracy. Okay. So. Um, so some of you may be wondering, why don't you include socialism or communism there? Okay. These are economic systems. Okay. So um, that is separate. And obviously, sometimes these are very much intertwined with the politics, but these are separate. And so I want to briefly just go over some of the economic systems because those also tie in with the First Amendment. So again, for much of, of history, especially Western civilization, we had feudalism. So we had serfs, we had landlords who owned the land, the serfs who worked the land, and of course, uh, an, a um, not only a power situation there, but also an economic difference, um, huge difference between that. And so often there, for the most part, there was this two-part system, either you were poor, working the land in these agricultural-based economies, or you were rich, you owned the land, okay? So socialism is, um, there can be private ownership, but especially state control of, of the key parts of the society. So um, state-run education. So for example, you see that, I mean, we, we think we are maybe a purely capitalistic country. We are not, we are not. This is on a spectrum here. So, so we have, in order to succeed as a, as a society, we have had to assume state control of many parts of our, of our operation of our society, including education. Okay. We have health, healthcare, of course, in the name of, um, of Medicare and Medicaid for the old people and, um, and poor. And obviously, as you well know, in several other, many other countries, many other developed countries have socialism to the extent of all of healthcare is taken care of. So your safety nets, um, like food stamps, um, like uh, unemployment, things like that are also socialistic, of course. Obviously, sometimes state-owned utilities, state-owned transportation. So again, it's a degree of socialism. You know, we don't have state-owned utilities. Some socialistic countries do, okay? Um, in forms of communism, so here you don't really have individual ownership. Here you have collective ownership of everything. And obviously, even though we talk about China and um, and Russia and the former Soviet Republic being communistic, really they were much more, they've been much more socialistic where, where again, it's the state have owned it, these things. So um, we haven't been able to have true communism there. True capitalism, the free exchange of good, private ownership, again, no government interference, that's called laissez-faire democracy. Um, so there's not these regulations. Um, and as we well know, that um, that more laissez-faire uh, capitalistic system has led to numerous crashes. So the, the lack of regulation of the banking and stock market industries, for example, led to the Great Depression, the stock market crash of 1929. And so um, what we have here is basically, again, as I mentioned, no system ex exists in its purest form. It's on a continuum. And what we have realized in this country is in order to, to survive, um, we have, again, put in regulations. We have added in safety nets to protect people. And basically, those sorts of accommodations have prevented the overthrow of government because we have had this ability to change our laws, to change how we operate. Um, we have, again, been able to add in those safety nets, those regulations that have protected people 
and therefore maybe quelled some um, some regul some overthrow of government. So, um, you know, Germany in, in the 1930s did not have a lot of these accommodations. There was tons of people out of, out of work. There were tons of people who were dirt poor and um, and starving. And that basically helped give a strong man like um, Adolf Hitler the ability to rise to power to solve this problem. Okay. Okay. So basically, again, open information, free press, free speech are the enemy of dictatorships. Okay. So those, that is why one of the first things when a, when a, when there is an overthrow of government, that government tries to control the media. Okay. Obviously that is much tougher now, but you can imagine in the pre-internet days, um, the first things they would do, they would take over the radio stations, the TV stations, the newspapers to control what people knew, because if you can control what people know, you can control, of course, what they think. Okay. Central to a democracy, as we mentioned here, is that free press, free speech, the ability to, to talk, to debate, to have the information needed to make these sorts of decisions. So just uh, to finish up a, a little bit of historical context here in the, in the US and, and Western civilization as well. So as far as freedom of the press, one of the freedoms in the First Amendment, key to that has been, of course, the development of the press itself. So we have Gutenberg inventing the press in the mid 1400s, leads to that first press, spreads to England. Um, this had many, many um, impacts. It led to um, the change in, in the economy, which led to a growth of the middle class. It led to um, social mobility. It led to a change in religion. That is where we got the Protestant religion when suddenly we have these the, the production of, of Bibles where people can now um, um, own the word of God. So before the, the press, these books were terribly expensive. They were owned only by the rich and the religious institutions. If you wanted to, your pathway to God, you didn't read the Bible because you could not read and you did not could not own a Bible. Suddenly, with the well, not suddenly, this took a couple hundred years in many cases, or a hundred years. Um, suddenly, as the price for um, these books went way down, we had increased literacy. People could, again, read the Gutenberg Bible was the first one published. People could read for themselves the word of God. That ended up leading to the Protestant Reformation, um, which led to a lot of these other, other changes as well. So we have, and also, of course, this uh, be able to, the ability to spread um, scientific knowledge as well. All this leads to, to huge changes in the 15, 14, late 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, you know, the Renaissance, great changes. All of these are, are ingredients for democracy, okay? The growth of the middle class, the increased literacy rates, all of these things let, kind of led to this, this mix. This, all the ingredients were there to create a democracy. And that, of course, brings us to the United States in 1776. And we'll go ahead and stop there. And we'll talk more about this and the First Amendment on Wednesday. I'm sorry, Thursday. Okay. See you guys on Thursday. Be sure to do your reading. Be sure to be ready for your quiz in class at the beginning of class on Thursday. Bye, guys.